And um, so, welcome. We're glad that you are here. And all those who are, are visiting uh, again. We are continuing our, um, our uh, celebrating the uh, 500th year of uh, Martin Luther's nailing of the 95 Thesis. I, last time I was, I was talking, we did Sola Scriptura. And today, we are doing Sola Gratia which in Latin is by grace alone, okay? During the Reformation, there were many truths in God's word. The gospel had been lost because of tradition. And when people were able to open their Bibles and to read, they began to discover that many of the traditions were contrary to what the Bible taught. And do you remember, Paul said at one time, if I bring you any other gospel than what I brought you the first time I was here, don't believe me. And even if an angel comes and tells you something different than what I first taught you, don't believe him. The gospel, the good news, had been lost. And so, as we go into this next subject, I want to pray and thank God that he shared the light with these men and women of the dark ages so that we may enjoy the truth that we have today. Let's pray. Father, again, we pause and thank you so much that these men and women during those ancient times were courageous enough to take the truths of your word and to declare them and to share them at the risk of their own lives. We thank you for protecting and preserving your word that we may have these truths today. And we pray, Lord, that today we see Jesus in a light that is the truth about him and the truth about you that we may never have known if it hadn't been for the courage of these people. So, Lord, I pray that you will bless our time together and that you will use this voice and use these words to your glory and reach the hearts of each of us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I have read a book um, recently called What's So Amazing About Grace. Anybody have read that book? Uh, I read it one time, and then I, my dad gave it to me s several years ago. And I, I read it a second time recently here. Uh, it's by Philip Yancey. And in his book, he tells a story about a conference that was taking place in Great Britain on comparative religions. And it drew experts from around the world to debate and discuss what if any belief or contribution did the Christians bring to the world that was unique from all other religions. And these great uh, uh, theologians and uh, people got together, they talked about the incarnation, uh, but other religions had some belief that about God appearing in human form and they brought up uh, the resurrection. But again, other religions had beliefs of those returning from the dead as well. The debate continued for quite a while until the famous theologian C.S. Lewis came into the room and asked what was the discussion about. And they told him of the question, what unique contribution did Christianity bring to the world religions? And he said, that's easy. It's grace. And then after some discussion, everybody had to agree. You know, the Reformation, truth, grace alone, is important to know that these people sacrificed so much so that this um, good news about God's grace could be available to all people in the world. This teaching of God who loves us, no strings attached, is not natural to us as human beings. To love unconditionally the way Jesus did goes against the instincts of humanity. I was telling someone the other day, I said, all we're asked to do is to love everybody. And I repeated it. I said, we need to love everybody. And then all of a sudden, it hit the person I was talking to. That's hard to do. 
Jesus said, be ye therefore, what? Perfect, even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Even though Jesus isn't, doesn't mention the word grace in the Gospels, which, by the way, grace means, the definition of grace is unmerited favor. Unmerited favor. But even though Jesus doesn't mention grace, okay, he talks about it and illustrates God's grace to the world that has no grace. Jesus talks about God's grace in the sun shining on the good as well as the bad. God's grace is described where the birds in the air are, gather their fruit, where they haven't plowed or harvest to earn it. Wildflowers unattended bloom on the rocky hillsides. Jesus illustrated God's grace through stories like the prodigal son. He challenges us to be like our Father in heaven, a people distributing grace in an ungrace world. The definition of grace, unmerited favor from God. And in fact, the discovery in the Reformation of people like Martin Luther was is that we are saved, truly saved, by grace, God's grace alone. Nothing that you do will merit any credit for you. It is God's grace alone. Let's continue our story of Martin Luther. In fact, Luther himself struggled with guilt. Um, maybe some of you can relate to this. He never felt that he was at a point where he could say, have anybody ever asked you, are you saved? Anybody ever asked you that? Most of us would say, I hope so, right? I hope so. Martin Luther felt the same way. He was never sure whether he was in good standing with God or not. In fact, he felt the burden of it got... Um, he felt like for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift. He could not accept that. It was very difficult for him to accept that. And so he began to, because he was taught that this is what you could do, is that if you would go and give your life to God in a, um, in a monastery... And that you would uh, flagellate yourself so many times and you would take a vow of silence and you would do all these things and torture your body that you would rid yourself of the sin in your life and then you could be in right standing with God. His picture of God was that God was ready to, uh, had a whip and was ready to whip on you any time. So if you did it before he did, then you probably had more control over that. But that's the picture that Martin Luther had about God as an angry God ready to snuff him out if he did something wrong. In fact, we discover, he discovered by a friend that it was impossible by his works of penance or anything that he could do, it was impossible for him to save himself, which was quite a point at which he became very despondent, very discouraged, because he realized that it was impossible for him to be saved. There are people all around you that look at Christianity and they say, I couldn't do all those things. In fact, many, maybe even some of you who are here, have gotten to a point where you're just so discouraged about your performance that you have said, what's the use? I can't do it anyway. My friends, I want to give you hope and encouragement. God has you right where he wants you. When you get to that point, as Martin Luther did, God sent to Martin Luther a man by the name of Staupitz. In fact, reading out of the great controversy, I read, when it appeared to Luther that all was lost, God raised up a friend and helper for him. The pious Staupitz opened the word of God to Luther's mind and bade him look away from himself, 
cease the contemplation of infinite punishment for the violation of God's law, and look to Jesus, his sin-pardoning Savior. Instead of torturing yourself on account of your sins, throw yourself into the Redeemer's arms. Trust in Him, in the righteousness of His life, in the atonement of His death. Listen to the Son of God. He became man to give you the assurance of divine favor. Love Him who first loved you. Thus spoke this messenger of mercy. His words made a deep impression upon Luther's mind, and after many struggle with the long-cherished errors, he finally was enabled to grasp the truth and peace, peace came to his troubled soul. A time when the church taught that you could buy your way to heaven was during that time of Martin Luther. Uh, the Pope at that time had said that uh, we need some money to build uh, St. Peter's Cathedral, and so he sent many different uh, friars all over the, the empire and one that came to Germany to Luther's house was a man by the name of Johann, uh, Johann Stetzel. And uh, thank you. And so he was called by Luther the preacher of indulgences. Now, the interesting thing about it is what's an indulgence? Okay? And indulgences were pardons of grace for sins you had committed or even future sins that you might commit, that you could purchase to help build St. Peter's Cathedral. And they had a scale. He had a, a, a chart of what sins cost how much to get pardoned. So you had this list of sins. If you did this, then you could, you could get... Uh, in fact, there was no sin that you couldn't buy forgiveness for. Even if you violated the mother of God. Okay? There was a price. And what was interesting is, is that not only that, Tetzel told the people that you could even buy forgiveness for those of your uh, 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 family that have died and gone to purgatory. He said, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Straight to heaven. These were the deceptions and the darkness in which had come that to think that the gospel and grace, God's salvation, could be purchased by just a few shekels. It's interesting because Luther, at that time, he, uh, in great controversy, it says that he entered now after hearing what this, because he was the priest at the time, and people would come in and do confession to him. And uh, he would say, have you, you know, repented? And are you sorry for what you've done? And, and they would say, well, um, not really, but here I have this certificate that says I've already been forgiven. And he said, you have to honor that. And uh, Martin Luther began to tell his parishioners, no, I'm not honoring a piece of paper that says that you are, you are forgiven. And so that word gave, got back to Tetzel and his, uh, the change and stuff. They tried to return the indulgences back to Tetzel and say, I want my money back. Okay? So in other words, if you knew that you were going to go out that weekend and have a really good time and, and do all kinds of uh, uh, devious stuff, you could buy the forgiveness ahead of time and go out and do it and you had a free pass. And Martin Luther got to the point, he's saying, you know what, we're building the, t the, the, the church of St. Peter's Cathedral, we're building it on the sins of people. And the more sins, the more money. So he said, we're encouraging people to go out and sin. But in uh, Great Converse, it says, Luther now entered boldly upon his work as a champion of the truth. His voice was heard from the pulpit in earnest, solemn warning. He set before the people the offensive character of sin and taught them that it is impossible for man by his own works to lessen its guilt or evade its punishment. In other words, Luther was saying, listen, 
If you think that you can buy your forgiveness, or if you think that you can just go out and sin and, and do that, then you don't understand what sin is. Because if you do, you would realize that it is impossible for you as a born sinner to keep or change on your own. It's impossible. Nothing but repentance toward God and faith in Christ can save the sinner. The grace of Christ cannot be purchased. It is a free gift. He counseled the people not to buy indulgences, but to look in faith to a crucified Redeemer. He related his own painful experience in vainly seeking by humiliation and penance to secure salvation. And assured his hearers that it was by looking away from himself and believing in Christ that he found finally peace and joy. So Martin Luther nailed his 95 thesis against the indulgences. What he did was he was trying to put down 95 articles to, uh, against indulgences and the sale of indulgences and he was hoping for a debate, that people would come and debate with him, and it was, was, uh, he wasn't really trying to go against. In fact, as you read the 95 Theses, and I've all read them all, he was quite supportive and trying to support the honor of the, the Pope. He thought Tetzel was out doing these things and claiming these things, and his intention was never to break from the church. His intention was to reform and bring the church back to the Bible. Number 28 of his 95 thesis. Listen to what he said. It is certain that when the penny jingles in the money box, gain and avarice can be increased, but the result of the intercession of the church is in the power of God alone. Number 62 the true treasure of the, God, of the church is the most holy gospel of the glory and the grace of God. Number 67, the indulgences with the preacher's cry as the greatest graces are known to be truly such insofar as they promote gain. Yet they are in truth, number 68, the very smallest graces compared with the grace of God and the piety of the cross. It's amazing to me that God's grace was demonstrated in God's word in the very beginning with Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve were created, they were created on what day? Can anybody tell me? The sixth day. What was the next day after they were created? A work day? It was the Sabbath. A rest day. Their first day on earth was a vacation, right? How does that work? When you get a job and you go and get your job, they say, we're going to give you a week's vacation first. Do they do that? God's grace does. They had, why, why did they have this beautiful home? God made this beautiful home for them and gave them one day to just enjoy that for their first day of life, just to enjoy it. What more? demonstrates God's grace except the cross of Calvary. God was gracious, and he has always been gracious. He, his grace has gone against nothing that they did. In fact, even when they fell to the devil's lie in chapter 3 of Genesis, God still showed his grace. He came looking for Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve were hiding, and God said, where are you? And Adam came out and finally said, uh, we're hiding. And God said, why are you hiding? And what does he say? Adam says, I was afraid. We're naked. We're ashamed, and, 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 and we're afraid. And God says, well, what did you do? She made me do it. Men have been doing that ever since, too. She made me do it. And then she turns. In, now, did he go, if I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, did he go to Adam and say, shame on you, Adam? Did he do that? Did he point, the, did he point his finger at Adam and say, shame on you, 
that you did this. You're toast. Is that what he said? No. He turns to the woman, Eve, and he says, what have you done? The devil made me do it. <laughs> okay? In fact, they were even believing God, right? Bl blaming God. Weren't they blaming God, really? That serpent you made, if you hadn't made him in the first place, we, we wouldn't be in this mess? Did God turn to Eve and say, shame on you, Eve? Did he do that? No. In fact, what he does is he turns to the devil and he says these beautiful words. He says, listen, you messed with my kids, now you're toast. Essentially, that's what he said. That's my paraphrase. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between her seed and your seed, and he will bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. What he was saying is one day Jesus would come, the seed of the woman, and destroy him, the author of sin. Grace. God's grace. The Bible is full of it. Noah found favor in the eyes of God. Is that anything that was Noah such a special guy? No. Noah found favor, God's grace, and he and his family were saved. Abraham was chosen by grace. Every prophet, every king, everyone was God's grace was demonstrated through it all. In fact, the Bible says to us, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not your own doing. It is a what? It is the gift of God to us, not as a result of our works or earning, so that no one may boast for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Jesus, while we were yet enemies to God, Jesus died for us. While we were still cursing him on our lips, he died for us. While they were nailing his hands and feet on that wood, he was dying for us. He didn't ask, how many of you want to accept my, uh, my death for your salvation? Did he you know, get a, a poll first before he made his decision to come down? Well, you know, if I get a hundred, then maybe it's worth it. Did he do that? He did it. He left heaven and he came and he died on Calvary because of his grace, his love for you and I. And it even while we rejected him, he still did it. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, and he appeared in, in Jesus, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. By the way, what does the Bible call our good works? Filthy rags, okay? But God offers us a brand new garment, His righteousness. But according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Jesus said, you are justified. You are justified. You've gotten your pardon. I want you, if you don't remember anything else today, I want you to remember this. There is nothing you can do to make God love you more than he already does. And there is nothing you can do that would make him love you any less. Amen. Remember that. So too, at the present time, my friends, there is a remnant chosen because of their goodness. Is that what it says? Because they're the right kind of people. Because they're children of Abraham. Or followers of Ellen White. They are chosen by what? By grace. 
But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, it wouldn't be grace, right? If there was anything that you and I could do to kind of earn that, that favor, then it no longer would be a gift or grace, would it? The wages of sin is what? The gift of God is eternal life. Why? Because He loves us. He loves us. Now, one of the things I want to make clear is we are saved by grace and grace alone. But Jesus said, your works declare the glory of God. Your good works. Are good works important? Of course, gives evidence of our faith and trust in Jesus because God said, what? He is working in us to will and to do his good purpose. We do good things because, not to be saved, but because we are saved. God's grace changes lives. Now, as Seventh-day Adventists often, we don't, we don't believe and trust that God's grace can change lives. Because one of the things that we have a tendency to do is to make sure that everybody's doing the correct thing. And we are, are very good at going up and telling them whether they're right or they're wrong. And instead of allowing God's grace and his love to change people, it can happen. The only problem is fear works better than grace. Did you know that? Fear can happen just like these people who are coming to me and saying, is it the end of the world? Is it the end of the world? I, I heard these things and this is the end of the world. Why are they coming to me and asking me things? Do they have peace? No, they're afraid. And I've seen it all through my 40 years of ministry. It's come and go. People, and why do you think sometimes pastors use fear? Works. But it doesn't last. I've seen these things. Last time I heard it was 9-11. Oh, we were pretty sober at that point in time. In fact, it even lasted almost a week. But after that week, people got complacent. Oh, we were wrong. And so on and so forth. Fear works, but it doesn't last. But I'm going to tell you something. Grace God's grace will change lives permanently. Permanently. In fact, uh, what does God's grace create? It says, but by grace of God, I am, Paul says, what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was within me. Every day, as he realized and studied the, the, and got to know the grace of God, it began to change his own life, and he began to see that those graces that God poured out that he received from God, he began to share and, and, and with others. My experience has been this. I have um, a pretty uh, heavy foot when I drive, Okay. Anybody tried to keep up with me may say, yes, he does. Um, nobody has this problem, probably. I'm speaking to the choir here. But anyway, the point is, is that um, uh, in my lifetime, I've had a few, you know, citations here and there for my driving habits, okay? Um, you know, I think they stopped doing that when I turned 60, though, because they must be profiling my age or something there, and they don't stop me as much or whatever. Maybe that or much slower. But there was a time when I was stopped, even on my trip up to Stevenson, I was on my way back, and, uh, and I got stopped by the Skamini County Sheriff, and he pulled me over, and he says, you know you were going too fast. I said, officer, I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention, and I went through all of my explanation, which I didn't have much good explanation, but... Um, I've used before that I'm, I'm a pastor and I'm on my way at an emergency and okay, all right. sometimes that works, sometimes. I've had a few, a few that I've got. Well, you know, this man was very nice to me. They're all nice, um, but 
he was gracious to me because he gave me a warning. And in my heart, I was very thankful for that. So do you think that once he went back to his car, I received the warning, and then I just squealed my tires and raced down the road at the top speed? I had just been showing grace. If I had done that, what would I think about the grace? Would I have appreciated it? No, and he probably would have ran up there and said, listen, I let you off, what are you doing? No, I was very careful, and I was very happy that I didn't get a ticket, and I'm just, just driving as careful as I can all the way home, and it lasted probably at least two or three days, and I was just very, very good. Now, just a few weeks later, <laughs> I was driving 14 again, only going into Vancouver. This time, I got stopped again, and he wasn't as gracious, and... and Rightly so, I probably deserved, I did, I deserved it, because I had gotten up before. So he wrote me a ticket. No. So I wrote it, they wrote me a ticket. In my heart, I, I was angry. As I pulled away, I was angry, because I was in a hurry somewhere. He pulled me over, he gave me this ticket, and in my heart, I felt, David, this rebellion kind of, well up and says, you know what I'd do? I'd just, I'd just take off or whatever. You know? Did it motivate me to obey the laws? No. In fact, I was going to, you know, I was grumbling back and forth. The issue is, do you see the difference? The difference is that oftentimes, and even as parents of our children, are you teaching them what grace is? Because you know what? It is so important so that we have that understanding of God's grace. And grace does change our hearts. God's grace can change our hearts. Um, this, God's grace awakens in us a grace that we live by and then show to others. Being Counter, uh, I read a book here recently called The Good Faith. It was recommended by another pastor. And this is the quote. It, it's written by David Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons, who, were, uh, who started the Barna Group. I don't know if any of you know. It's a, it's a, a Barna Group is a group, a Christian group that takes polls uh, on Christians all over the country. It's very interesting, some of the polls they come out with. But they said this, and quoting from their, their book, being countercultural means bringing good faith. In other words, we live in a culture today. How many feel like you live in a culture that's very foreign to you than it was, say, even 15, 20 years ago? I, it, it, it's amazing to me. Being countercultural means bringing good faith, a vision for what is orderly and right, abundant and generous, beautiful and flourishing with life and relationships to the broader culture. In other words, he's saying there's an opportunity for Christians today that is amazing to help our culture today. This vision is not just an individual pursuit. It is best expressed in communities of faith where believers love and care for one another will then and then invite others into an experience that same grace that is shown in our community here. In other words, what they're saying, if you want to reach the culture in our community, in our jobs, in wherever we feel, it begins right in our own house here how we treat one another, how we love each other, how we have relationships with each other. That is what he's saying. That is what, in fact, I want to propose to you, that's why we do church. That is why we're here. That is why we're, and it's the church is not a building that we come to uh, every week. It, a church is the community in which we build relationships with one another to demonstrate God's grace to a community that needs it desperately. 
That is what God intended, that His grace would also be a demonstration in the lives of His people. A living grace, I like to call it a graceful church. Are we a graceful church? To forgive each other as Jesus has forgiven us? Let me ask you this question, Riverside. If Riverside would all of a sudden disappear from our community, would we be missed? If you disappeared from your neighborhood, your family just disappeared, moved away or whatever, would you be missed? If you're working in your, your, wherever you work and you're working there, would you be missed if all of a sudden you're gone? It's a good question. I have to say that some of our members are missing today because you know where they're at? They're down in Dignity Village feeding the homeless and taking care of those people this morning. Amen? I gave them a free dispensation. I gave them an indulgence. I wrote a little paper, indulgence, so that next confession, they'll be okay. How can we truly appreciate God's grace unless you understand what sin has caused? How can you really appreciate God's grace unless you realize your true condition? That without God's grace, it is impossible for you to change. It is impossible for you to make it to heaven. Do you really know your true condition? No matter how good you may think you are, it is through God's grace and only that that you will be saved. Matthew, um, I want to uh, read a quote from Desire of Ages. If some of you think, well, I don't know. This doesn't sound right. Let me ask, I'm going to go to uh, Desire of Ages, page 478. Millions of human beings are bound down under false religions in the bondage of slavish fear, of a stolid indifference, toiling like beasts of burden, bereft of hope or joy or aspirations here, and with only a dull fear of the hereafter. Boy, that describes people today in this, in this world. And this was written, I don't know, 100 years ago. Okay, or more. It is the gospel of grace of God alone that can uplift the soul. The contemplation of the love of God manifested in His Son will stir the heart, arouse the powers of the soul as nothing else can. Some people say, well, Pastor, you just preach too much about grace and love. Hallelujah! Because you know what? It is the gospel that will change lives. It's God's grace that will change lives. Talking about changed lives. There's a man by the name of John Newton. Some of you recognize John Newton from 18, 1725 to 1807. John Newton lived a pretty colorful life at a young age. He became a, ca a, a sailor at an early age, and then he became a sea captain of a, of, of a, of a slave ship. And for many years, he was in the business of, uh, of taking slaves from Africa and transporting to the Indies and Americas. Not a very um, moral job, I'd say. But he didn't care, because he was pretty immoral. And... When he came to the point where he began to, went through a storm, a storm that scared him a bit. I'm not saying that fear, God doesn't use fear once in a while. It does say fear of the Lord, and I think sometimes we have to recognize who God is and who we are. But I do know this, is that he was a bit scared, and he, he, he said, and he came and he discovered the gospel. He discovered the gospel, and he began to, he continued as a slave ship captain, and he began to get a conscience, and he said, this isn't right. And pretty soon he had to quit, because he couldn't continue to do that. And this is one of the things that is, uh, well, first of all, this is what's on his tombstone now. 
John Newton, clerk, once an infidel and a libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa was by the rich mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, preserved and restored and pardoned and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. Nearly 16 years at the curate of his parish and 28 years as rector of the St. Mary's, Woolworth. Here's a changed man. This is what grace did for John Newton. In fact, he also um, said these words at his death. My memory is nearly gone, but I remember two things, that I am a great sinner and that Christ is a great Savior. That's a great testimony for a life, isn't it? In fact, that's why he wrote this, this beautiful hymn, Amazing Grace. Today, I want you to know that one of the truths of the gospel is that you and I are saved by grace alone. It's not part of your works. You know, I used to have been taught that, okay, I'll do the best I can and then Jesus will make up the difference. No. There is nothing that you could do except trust Jesus and his love for you. He makes it all happen. There's no making up the difference. He made it all happen. And all the glory goes to him, not to us. That's why John Newton said, amazing grace. I want us to stand together in closing to sing this song, number 108, Amazing Grace. Some of you here today that this is all new and revelation to you that God, God's love is so great for you that there is nothing that you can do to save yourself. 
if this is a new thing and you want us to pray with you, we're going to have Tammy is going to be up here in the front, and we would ask that everyone would leave quietly and, and to visit in the, in the lobby if they can. But uh, we would like to pray with you. And so Tammy is going to be leading a group here. Please come forward after the service and, uh, and participate in our prayer here for you because there is good news in the gospel, isn't there? There is good news, good news. Let's, let's pray, shall we? Father, we thank you again for those of you who, those of us who have come here, that we pray, Lord, that you will please bless those who weren't able to come. Be with those who are ministering this morning. And we pray, Lord, that, that we will get a fresh glimpse every day of your goodness and your grace and your love. I pray, Lord, that it will begin to change, that the Holy Spirit will use that to change our hearts as we go to the foot of Calvary and see Jesus hanging there for us, that he would have died for one of us. I pray, Lord, that that will begin to change our hearts so that we could minister grace to our, our families, to our church, and to our community. Oh, Lord, I pray that you'll be with each one here, that they will every day experience your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.